Welcome to today's presentation on IDEX SDMA. Well, we're going to address what to do when you get a result with a mildly elevated SDMA. So what we're going to cover is um, uh, very briefly discuss what SDMA is, really talk about what does a mild elevation mean and what are the next steps. Now we've talked about what SDMA is before. So if you've got, if you wanted some more information on that, there are some other um, sessions in our IDEX continuing education series where you could look at that. And also um, have a listen about SDMA versus creatinine. But you know, the, the big things with SDMA compared to creatinine, and keep in mind creatinine is still a very useful marker, but you know, it goes up much sooner with a reduction in GFR than creatinine. So it's an earlier marker, less affected by other things like muscle mass and can be a marker of things secondarily affecting the kidneys. I guess we always have that question of why should we include SDMA in a profile? And the answer to that question is, well, kidney disease is common. You know, if we look at over the lifetime of a cat, there's probably a one in three chance that, you know, by the time they're a senior or geriatric cat, that one in three cats will have kidney disease. Um, and up to one in 10 dogs may develop kidney disease in their lifetime. So it is something that we're going to be seeing in both cats and dogs in our clinics. So, you know, the sorts of reasons we're doing diagnostic testing, some wellness or preventive care, pre-anesthetic testing, patients with clinical signs, monitoring pets with no disease, um, uh, testing sick pets, um, are all reasons that we would be including SDMA. And I think it's really important that we don't exclude SDMA from profiles in patients who are clinically well. So like pre-anesthetic testing, like a wellness or preventive care visit, because patients with iris stage one chronic kidney disease are almost certainly going to be asymptomatic with their kidney disease. So we are missing out on identifying a subset of patients if we only test patients with clinical signs. So that's really important to keep in mind. I guess there are a couple of situations where we might see SDMA increased. There are patients that we're gonna see in our clinics that have clinical signs of kidney disease. So they might have PUPD or inapidence or weight loss or dehydration or gastrointestinal signs like vomiting. They may be pale because of anemia. They may have oral ulceration. Um, if they're also azotemic and isocyanuric, guess what? Everyone knows how to deal with those patients. So the diagnostics to look for underlying causes, the management with, you know, diet and rehydration and phosphorus management, all that sort of thing. You know, everyone's very familiar with that. But I guess the time where SDMA is sometimes perceived as being a bit more challenging is in a patient that is clinically normal, doesn't have azotemia, yet the SDMA is mildly increased. So the question often comes, well, what do we do next in that situation? If we think about the IRIS, you know, IRIS International Oriental Interest Society produce guidelines for us, you know, um, on how to diagnose kidney disease, how to stage it, how to manage it. And in the past, making that diagnosis of uh, IRIS stage one or even early IRIS stage two kidney disease could be challenging. We could look for things like creatinine increasing within the reference interval. But unless you are using something like VetConnect Plus, where you have all those results displayed together, you weren't going to see that. We could look for things like a persistent renal proteinuria, but unless you were doing a urinalysis for another reason and noted there, were proteinuria, there was proteinuria, you weren't necessarily going to know that. We could look for things like abnormal kidney imaging, so changes in shape or size on radiographs, 
uh, changes in architecture on ultrasound. But in a patient that's asymptomatic, unless you were doing abdominal imaging for another reason, we weren't going to detect that. But with the advent of STMA, it allows us to more easily pick up those patients with iris stage one or early iris stage two kidney disease. One thing I really want to emphasize with this is we're not going to make that diagnosis based on a single STMA value. Just like a patient with a mildly increased creatinine, you want to demonstrate that that's persistent. So if we get that mild increase in STMA, everything else is okay. We're going to want to repeat that measurement. Then, you know, when we think of iris, we have the staging scheme. So we're going to look at creatinine for that. But since about oh, 2018 or 2019, um, STMA has also been part of that staging. So the STMA level is going to influence whether, you know, if we've got a patient uh, that's got a persistent elevation STMA, it's going to help us decide which stage of kidney disease they're at. And of course, beyond creatinine and STMA, we're also going to be evaluating things like a UPC ratio and blood pressure. So what opportunity does finding that mildly increased STMA that's persistently increased with no azotemia and no clinical signs, what opportunities is that affording us? And I think there's two main things there. First of all, it allows us to look for an underlying cause. The second thing is, even if we can't find a cause for that kidney disease, it allows us to take steps to try and slow the progression um, of the kidney disease. And what we're trying to do with that is give patients a longer period of time without clinical signs. So in, in helping you do this, there's the IDEX STMA algorithm, which, which you can easily access and we can make that available to you. So it gives you some guidelines of what to do. If you have a patient whose STMA is over 20, that patient probably needs more evaluation at that point in time. Whereas if it's in that 15 to 19 range, so mild elevation, we need to have a look at the patient and see where we're at. In any case, whether it's a mild or more marked elevation, the first step we want to do is evaluate a complete urinalysis. So that's the physical properties, so things like colour, clarity, concentrating ability, um, a chemical analysis with a dipstick, and a microscopic exam. If we have a normal urinalysis, a patient that's not azotemic, they may still have some concentrating ability left. There are no other clinical signs of PUPD or weight loss or all that sort of thing. If all of that is normal, realistically, we don't need to do anything more dramatic at that stage, but would suggest in two to four weeks time, we should recheck their kidneys. So things like doing an STMA, a creatinine, ideally a phosphate and urea, and a urinalysis. If that STMA elevation is persistent, that's telling us there's likely a reduction in glomerular filtration rate. And remember, that's what STMA is telling us. It's a marker of GFR. Doesn't necessarily mean kidney disease. Doesn't necessarily mean chronic disease. Can go up with acute or things like pyelonephritis. It's just telling us there's a reduction in GFR. So if that is persistent, then we can take steps to go further. We can look for a cause double check history, exposure to toxins, recent illness, things like that. We may want to do a good idea to your UPC ratio. If you think it's appropriate, we might do a urine culture. You know, if you think it's appropriate, test for FIV, FELV, check thyroid status. You know, if it's a dog and it's you know, in the right environment, maybe check for leptospirosis, um, check their blood pressure you know, evaluate their hydration status and things like that. So we're looking to see, is there something that we can manage in that patient and maybe correct that reduction in GFR? Even if we don't find anything, we can then take steps to try and slow progression. And this is not dramatic stuff we're talking about. We're thinking about things like 
making sure that patient has free access to water all of the time. So if they're an inside outside dog or cat, make sure there's water on both sides of the door. If it's a dog that the client likes to take running with them, for example, guess what? Take water for the dog as well as for themselves when they do that. Being careful about their diet. You know, not necessarily saying to you at this point in time that they need to go on a kidney diet, but even getting them on a good quality adult maintenance diet is going to mean it's got a sensible level of phosphorus because we know that high phosphorus is going to stimulate the progression of kidney disease. And there are some clients feeding their pets poor quality diets that we know have high phosphorus levels. So simply doing that's going to be helpful. If you think things are progressing, maybe going to a good quality senior diet, that's probably midway between an uh, adult maintenance diet and a kidney diet. If you think they're progressing more, maybe start the kidney diet. We know the kidney diet is helpful for management, but you don't want to wait till they're not eating and feeling unwell to start it. So maybe it allows us to start that a little sooner. Let's be careful with nephrotoxic drugs. And you know, what we're often thinking about is non-steroidals in this situation. I'm not going to say to you, you can't use non-steroidals. These are often middle-aged or older dogs and cats who may have concurrent degenerative joint disease. So if they need a non-steroidal for their quality of life, they should have it. But try and use the lowest dose we can, maybe combine it with you know, an opioid or gabapentin so we can use a lower dose. If that patient needs to have an anesthetic, you know, Irish stage one kidney disease is not a preclusion to them having an anesthetic, but we'd make sure they're hydrated and we would monitor their blood pressure during the procedure. Maybe if it's a procedure that we'd normally give them a non-steroidal with, we might wait till the end and they're awake, give them the non-steroidal at that stage and use an opioid as that perioperative um, analgesia. And then obviously if we know a patient's got um, iris stage one or early stage two disease, if we found something we can treat, we want to monitor that STMA. Even if we found something we could, didn't find something we could treat, we probably want to monitor that patient more closely. So instead of getting them back in 12 months time for another recheck, we might get them back in six months to assess what's happening with their renal parameters. I guess we also have that question sometimes of what are the chances if we've got that increased STMA, that it's going to persist over time. There was a retrospective study done within IDEX where they reviewed patients' um, records, 3.6 million dogs, 1.6 million cats. And what they did is they had identified patients that had a series of at least three STMAs and creatinines. The first result had to be within the reference interval. The second result had to be a mildly elevated STMA, so that ideally that STMA in the 15 to 19 range with that. And then they had to have another sample taken within a 12 month period to see whether the STMA was persistently increased. What they found with that is 48% of those patients that had initially a normal STMA, then a mildly increased STMA, 48% of them, that STMA remained persistently increased. And in that 15 to 19 range, um, it was more likely to persist if it was 19 than 18, than 17, than 16, than 15. So the higher it is in that 15 to 19 range, more likely it's going to persist. 52% of the dogs and cats assessed in that setting, the STMA went back to normal. But of that group, a number of them had um, another sample beyond that. And of that 52%, 24% of them, the STMA went up again within the next 12 months. So when we put that together, there were 72% um, uh, of those patients that initially had a mildly increased STMA, that that was persistent with that. So we've got a reasonable chance that that STMA is going to stay up. The other interesting thing is they compared the creatinine. Um, at that initial stage of that mildly increased STMA, only 18% of those cats and dogs had an increased creatinine. By 12 months, if they were persistently elevated, 
only 50% of them had an increased creatinine with that. So we can't rely on a normal creatinine to say, oh, everything's normal, because it's going to lag behind with that. So an important point to remember, mildly increased SDMA, there's a reasonable chance that that's going to persist. They also checked it didn't really make a difference of whether that recheck was at four weeks, six months, or 12 months. The likelihood of the SUMA staying increased was the same. So checking them sooner is probably a good idea. So just in reflection, you know, SDMA is a marker of GFR. It allows us more opportunity to pick up those iris stage one or early stage two patients um, with to pick those patients up with early stage kidney disease than if we look at creatinine alone. That early diagnosis gives us an opportunity to either look for cause or to manage them to try and slow progression. And we talked about those steps of what to do beyond that. And there's that reasonable chance that that mildly increased STMA is going to persist in time. So hopefully this has been of value for you. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and we'll be back with you with another webinar um, some stage soon. Thanks very much for your time. Bye-bye.